All right, thank you. Good morning. Um, one of the, the interesting things, as, as we all know about giving presentations, is, you, is the first thing you look at is, so where are you in, in the order? And, you know, you don't want to be after lunch when everybody's sort of full and sleepy. And I thought, great, first thing in the morning to talk about the history of codes. What could possibly go wrong with that? Um, well, so the, the, the story of this code, and it was, it was the first um, attempt to do a national British lift code. And of course, it, as with all these codes, it begins with organizations, and organizations love committees. So we begin with uh, the British Industries National Council, which creates the Advisory Committee on um, Advisory Committee on, on Building Laws and Bylaws, which then creates the escal Lift and Escalator Installation Panel. And the panel, and this is how the panel is, was listed in the front of the code. And the panel was charged with examining uh, existing legislation to see if there were any changes. Before I go on, one of the challenges that historians face is, and certainly that I face, because one of the things that's of, of great interest to me is, well, who are these people? And um, when you get a list like this, and all you have are initials, um, and I never qu know quite how to interpret this, and um, my faculty home in my university is in the School of Architecture, so I'm surrounded by architects. And it may be a comparison of the relative <clears throat> humility of engineers that you um, won't tell me who you are. Now, now, who you are is important because if we, you know, and, and fortunately there are company names and I could sort of unpack this and I found everyone but our insurance guy. Um, because this, this is important in terms of being able to track back through their, their biographies, who they worked for, the wealth of knowledge that, that they brought to this. So this is a, a, a plea from someone who, and you never know who's going to be looking, who in the future may be interested in you. So give me your full name so I can, I can sort of track you down, because I'll find you eventually. So the lift and escalators uh, installation panel is established, and Edward Charles Harris is appointed chair. And this was an interesting choice because, of course, he founded E.C. Harris in 1911, which was the first multi-industry consultancy firm. So this was an interesting choice, not, not someone directly from the lift industry, but someone with a sort of broad perspective. And, and we've gone from the British Industries National Council to an advisory committee to this panel. And, of course, there's always one more step if you're a clever chair, is you set up a drafting committee so that you don't have to. And this is what Harris did. And Rendell Davies was appointed chair of the code drafting committee, which is another interesting choice because someone not from the lift industry, but associated uh, with the British um, Standards Institution, and in this instance, um, a heating and ventilation engineer. The other members of the drafting committee that we can see here uh, are interesting because of, well, perhaps who's not placed on the drafting committee. Uh, the architect is not there. Representative of the trades union is not there. And then another engineer, although we end up with seven members, which as you know, if you're on a voting committee, that's, that's a good number because then you're always, gonna, you're always gonna get a solution at a majority most of the time. But there's another way to parse this out that allows us to help understand some of the things that happened, and that is if we go a little more biographical information, we actually had two distinct generations represented here. Uh, for lack of a better way to talk about this, a younger generation and, and an older generation. And so, you know, Davis was one of the youngest members. Um, Atkinson probably is the same age, although I have yet to find a biography on him. Uh, and then, uh, so that we've got John William Stevens and, and, and Weaver also about the same age. So there's a sort of younger generation. But then there's the older generation, um, which is uh, David Green, Ernest Medway, and Charles Edwin Stevens. And there we had three of uh, the UK's oldest lift, lift firms represented, Waygood Otis, Medway Safety Lift, and Archibald Smith and Stevens. So you had two distinct generations this wealth of lift experience, if you added up all of the years in the industry, it's approximately 200 years of, of experience. So there's a lot of experience around the table. And they were charged 
as I said earlier, with examining existing legislation to see if changes were warranted. And they immediately, being a very good committee, said, well, we're going to expand our charge. And they expanded their charge to look at uh, legislation in the British Dominions and any existing legislation, glossaries, codes that they could find um, throughout Europe and the United States. Now, that's all we know. That's what they said they were going to do. There's no list of what they looked at. And the only legislation that I've been able to find in the UK was the Factory and Workshop Act of 1901, which concerned goods lifts in industrial settings. That's the only legislation I've been able to find. In the British Dominions, the only code I've been able to find is the uh, lift, it's not even a code, it's a legislative act, the Lift, Reg Lifts Reg Lift Regulation Act of 1908 uh, from Australia. So there's not a a lot of, of sort of what we might call local evidence here, and we can see that listed there, the Australia. This is what I was able to find that they may have looked at. <coughs> and one of the first things we can see is there's an interesting distribution, and in fact, it begins in 1908. We have codes and regulations in Germany, in Italy, France, South Australia, and all the way down to the American A-17 code. The first edition is in 1921. The context is important because the, the, the British efforts are entering into a conversation that now is well established of trying to write codes and regulations and, and, and sort out, well, you know, what would be the best things to bring forward to this unique setting. So, Perhaps they looked at all of this. We're not quite sure, although we'll see as we move through the talk that they looked at one source very, very closely. This is what they came up with. Two distinct codes, one for lifts and one for escalators, and 24, sex, 24 rules and 11 rules, and it's very straightforward. <coughs> and I'll, I won't go through this, but as, as you read the topics, it sort of moves forward in a very logical way and sort of breaks all this down. But what's not quite so evident here is what isn't mentioned. And by the way, all of the rules were accompanied by this single illustration. And this is all I needed. And what's missing is, and this single illustration shows, and you can read the schematics, it's an electric lift. Um, this code only concerned electric lifts and escalators. The word hydraulic does not appear in, in the 1935 code at all, which is a very strange thing when we consider that in the early 20th century, hydraulic lifts were still very prominent in the marketplace, very prominent in many buildings. But um, so we could interpret this perhaps that this is a very forward looking document with a sort of focus on electric lifts, no mention of hydraulic lifts. The other thing about this image is, and we can see it's, it depicts a standard lift installation in a stairwell, sort of very small. Well, by 1935, there were lifts in many other different situations throughout the UK, in office buildings and in hotels, yet this is presented as the sort of standard lift installation, which is an interesting choice. And I'm not quite sure where, where to take that, except it sort of says, well, perhaps this was still the dominant type of lift installation in the 30s if we think of small apartment buildings and houses and things like that. So we have code of contents, focusing on electric lifts, we have all of this information. And one of the challenges in, in looking through this from a historical perspective is, of course, this, this implies that you know, I can sort of parse out German and Italian and French. I can barely read English on a good day. Um, so sorting all of this out to sort of say, well, how does all of this relate to the 1935 code? When you do that, what you find is there's one source, really, one source that for, one source rather for the 1935 code, the A17 code. 
This is what the code authors seem to have paid the most attention to. Now, I will let you draw your own conclusions, but if you do a comparison, particularly between the 1931 edition, and the code committee began their work in September of 1931, so the, the third edition of the A17 code, fresh off the presses, completed their work four years later. If you do a code comparison, um, and before I get there, as, as a reminder, I'll sort of go ahead and do this. Three members of the, of the committee, both Weaver, Green, and Atkinson, were associated with Way Good Otis. Weaver had worked for a year in the United States, so the American code was well known in, in Britain, and we had three members of this committee who would have been very familiar with it through their association with Otis. And if we do a code comparison, British code on the left, the American code on the right, um, Every section in the British Code but two, there's an exact complementary component in the A17 Code. So there turns out to be little doubt uh, what the code authors were looking at. There, there is no comparable comparison with, with, with the other codes. And in fact, the other European codes in many ways were very different in their editorial focus. Well, this is the lift side. What about the escalator side? Every component of, of the escalator comes directly from the A17. Now, this, in fact, makes sense. If we think about the history of escalators, such a new product coming in the early 20th century, there was an enormous conversation across the Atlantic. This makes sense. This was rather startling to me that there was such a strong link between, between the two codes. Also in the British Code, uh, there were 94 terms that were defined. And this is where, as a historian, I become very interested. I'm, I'm interested in the language of the codes. But one of the things that's intriguing is the terms that we think are important to define, that we want people to know the meaning of, that help us understand, in this instance, a code, are very important. And I'll let you sort of scan through these. And they speak to, well, at, you know, it could be a new idea at a time that we choose, you know, that we, you know, we think it's, it's important, you know, that, that rheostatic control needs to be defined so that everyone understands. This is a very interesting gauge of the state of an industry at a particular moment, a sort of a snapshot of, well, this is, this is our understanding as defined by these terms. Uh, in red, we can see where I found a, a direct correlation to the American code and the terms defined there. Now, interestingly enough, the American code, 1931, probably ran about 230 pages. The British 1935 code is 35 pages. So there's a very interesting editing that takes place. And um, this is one example of a sort of a modest kind of editing where the American code on top, the British code on the bottom, and, and this occurred almost in every single instance where the British code, much more concise, uh, perhaps much more to the point. Uh, another example um, with regard to escalators, um, a really nice editing job, all of that simply becomes this. And I'll let you, so, and, and it's, it's, this perhaps speaks to the fact that, and this was uh, a point I made in, I think in my paper last year, the very first book published having anything to do with lifts was published in 1898 in the United States, and it was a book on elevator law. So the length of this and its detail may explain the American legal landscape, the brevity here, a, a, dif a difference in the UK. One of the things that you can find in the code, however, is this, which is very, very interesting. In the 1931 code, um, added as a note in the American code, talks about the use of lifts in the event of an emergency, specifically a fire. It's very interesting to me that in the British code, they, I mean, they give it context. They say experience in, in the USA but they feel that it's appropriate to repeat this and that recognition that or understanding that perhaps in a fire, in an emergency, lifts have a place in helping to evacuate people from buildings. 
the American Code has, in 1931, a very brief section on how, in fact, we, we could do this in terms of shaft design and, and, and very clear recommendations on that idea that is that now and once again has become something of great interest to, to the lift industry. So there, there are some echoes of some things in the past that sort of carry forward to what we're interested in today. And I jump slides. Um, so the, the, the code was both a sort of a, a very clear edited version of the American code, but also spoke very much of, of the time period. And in doing this research, one of the things that I found, um, and when you do research, you, you sort of sometimes find unexpected things. And although it's, it's far too early in the morning for an exam, um, although I flipped to my slide or sooner than I should have, um, it, would anyone care to give me the date of the first European code, the first attempt to write a European code? I mean, I've seen 1979. Is that a reasonable, <clears throat> that that seems to be the first attempt to write a European code, 1979? I hmm? I put it 77. 77, all right. That, so some, somewhere in there. Well, there's this. Safety in the construction and use of lifts, 1939, sponsored by the League of Nations an effort led by an Italian engineer who passed away before the code was complete. It, in fact, is an attempt to amalgamate all of the European codes. It's heavily illustrated and put out there. And of course, the date's rather auspicious and unfortunate, and that's why we don't know about this effort. But that desire to write an international code has been there for, for quite some time. And that surfaced during this research, and this will be something that is now um, sort of on my plate for further research, although the challenge has increased with this because there's also the, a Belgian code, there's a, a, a Finnish code, and there's some others that, that add in. And again, the language issue becomes uh, e even more and more interesting. But the, the context of, of, of this with the British Code, I think, speaks to that desire to, as, as the, the British uh, Drafting Committee looked across at other countries, and then this effort coming out four years later, and the British Code authors were also involved in that, speaks to both the past interest in the development of, of international codes and, and codes for specific countries, uh, clearly something that we continue to this day. Thank you.